Okay, so continuing with the third uh, lecture in the series of alternate energy sources in surgery. Uh, last time, at the end of part two, uh, we had finished with ligature, and uh, in this lecture, we'll continue with the other energy sources which are in common usage and some which are in not so common usage. We'll be focusing more on the ultrasonic dissector, the thunderbeat, the lasers, and we'll be touching upon the other energy sources which are not in very common usage, namely the diathermy, the microwave, the radio frequency ablation, the higher factor, the hydro dissection, and the cryotherapy. Now, coming to the ultrasonic energy, if you look at the ultrasonic energy, it can be used both for open and laparoscopic surgery. And it's got two kinds of uh, systems one, the lower power system, the high power system. The lower power systems basically are the aspirators, which are known as the PUSA knives. And the high power systems, these are the harmonic and auto sinks, which are working at more than 50,000 kilohertz uh, per second. The low power system, on the other hand, they work as a 23 kilohertz system. And these aspirators are uh, very well used for uh, neurosurgical purposes and for uh, dissecting out the liver tissue. The others are a uh, uh, prime example is a Thunderbeat. We'll talk about that in the later slides. Now, this is basically the harmonic machine. This is the generator that you have. This is the piezoelectric crystal and this handpiece. And these are the attachments through which the energy is delivered to the tissue. We'll talk about that uh, in the in further slides. Now, first, let's see the mechanism for its tissue effects. Number one is the cavitational fragmentation, which we talked about the Kusa knife. The cells are disrupted in low protein density areas, such as liver, brain, etc. But it spares the collagen rich tissues, like for example, the blood vessels, the nerves, and lymphatic. And that's why the amount of bleeding is much, much less. That's why it's more a less a bloodless kind of a dissection. It also has a cutting mechanism, and the actual power cutting is by relatively sharp. Now you see these two blades, a sharp blade vibrating at 55,000 uh, or 55,500 times per second longitudinally. So this blade is going to move longitudinally like this. So this blade moves longitudinally and this longitudinal movement is for a distance of about 80 micrometers, a range of 50 to 100 micrometers. And it cuts, cuts all tissues. Then it has got a coagulation uh, effect and this, the ultrasound energy is converted to mechanical energy and that is what leads to the coagulation effect. It whips the cellular proteins by breaking their hydrogen bonds to form a coagula. Coaptation and can also see the side wall, which is a very advantageous um, uh, scenario with the harmonic scalpel that can just by lateral pressure, you can see a vessel wall as opposed to electrosurgery where you have to have uh, grasp of both the walls of a particular blood vessel before before it can be sealed off or coagulated. And number four, it has got an adaptive technology. The newer generators have got an adaptive technology. It basically means there's intelligent energy delivery stops after the action is complete. The end result of using a harmonic scalpel or uh, ultrasonic energy source is that there is no melting, there's no charring, there's no smoke generation, and there's no sticking of tissue. The delivery of energy, as I said earlier, is through three compatible probes. So this is the shear that you have. Then you got the spatula, the ball electrode, and you got the hook. So these are the methods by which the tissue is ultimately delivered to the uh, to the, the, the energy is delivered to the tissue. Now, if you look at the shear, the coagulation uh, capability is up to five millimeters, but with the newer harmonic ace, it goes right up to 7 millimeter vessel ceiling, which roughly equivalent to a uterine artery. So you can deal with the uterine artery. Initially, harmonic was not advisable for just coagulating the uterine artery. It had to be uh, ligated. But now with the new harmonic ace, 7 plus 7 shears, you can even coagulate a uterine artery. So 7 millimeter vessels can now easily be tackled with the new shears. Then you've got the spatula blade and hook, which can coagulate vessels only up to 2 millimeters in diameter. Now, the advantage is it's got a least thermal spread, less than 2 millimeters, and least smoke production of all devices. The seal strength, when you have sealed a particular blood vessel, it can withstand two times the systolic blood pressure or roughly up to a 200 millimeters of mercury. Now, the cutting speed and extent of coagulation, you are either cutting or coagulating with the, with the shear or with the uh, spatula or with the probe. So, that would be vary on four factors. Number one, the power that you're pushing in. Number two, the blade sharpness. Number three, the tissue tension. And number four, the grip force. 
the minimal damage by this machine so by the ultrasonic source is easily uh, uh, can easily explain the marked reduction in the post op radiation so you done a post uh, you done a cholecystectomy with the help of a harmonic and suppose you have to go in for a re exploration and what will you find you find there are minimal additions in the area of the surgery that was uh, done in this particular patient so this is another advantage of this uh, harmonic or you may call it a uh, ultrasonic source energy now what happens when you combine electro surgery with ultrasonic energy now, the result is a thunder beam now this is an instrument which is combining the two it combines the ultrasonic energy and it combines the bipolar energy so this is the electrical energy the bipolar and it has got ultrasonic now this is used for a rapid and precise dissection while the bipolar energy helps in reliable vessel sealing together 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 you have a faster and precise dissection and reliable vessel sealing capability of up to 7 mm which now the new ace plus 7 delivers to you even with the ultrasonic source now if you look at the thunder beat probe it has got two kinds of um, uh, buttons to it the purple and the blue the purple is seal and cut and the blue is only seal now this seal and cut mode it delivers both bipolar and ultrasonic and i said earlier up to 7 mm vessel sealing significantly faster precise tissue dissection the jaws are designed to act both for dissection and grasping now in a harmonic blade in a harmonic blade it is not supposed to be a dissector but people do use it as a dissector is more of a grasping instrument for coagulation now here uh, for cutting and coagulation but here this jaw can be also used for dissection now it has got intelligent tissue monitoring what does that mean it means it's got improved temperature management there's a auto stop system for ultrasonic cutting devices that stops the energy output after transaction is complete and when the tissue is transacted the intelligent tissue monitoring automatically stops the energy output and the thunder beat goes into the cooling phase now the benefits include the fastest in class cutting speed reliable 7 mm vessel sealing precise dissection with fine jaw design always available bipolar energy minimal thermal spread fewer instrument exchanges and of course a reduced mist generation which helps to maintain enough visibility without Uh, perpetually cleaning your scope especially in laparoscopic surgery <clears throat> now coming to the second mode or the a very important mode of energy uh, in, when used in general surgery and that is we are talking about the laser this is again a depiction of the electromagnetic spectrum and we have traveled from here from the electrosurgical uh, energy in the in the area of the radio waves and now we are proceeding this is the visible light that we talk about in between the ultraviolet and infrared now we talk about laser which work in the near infrared infrared or near to ultraviolet or even in visible light now this is how uh, a typical laser machine looks like now the first of just a brief history the first laser was created by theodor meman in 1960 but the invention of the first carbon dioxide laser as the first high power continuously emitting laser by by was by our own indian working in bell lab in 1964 c kumar and patel now then followed a, a plastic surgeon isaac kaplan who along with an engineer sharon in early 1970s managed to successfully combine the visible neon laser with the invisible beam of a carbon dioxide laser so they matched the two things and into a focal plan and then later on kaplan designed numerous laser surgical techniques in plastic reconstructive surgery and that's how he came to be known as the father of laser surgery of, of present day laser surgery he died in 2012 at the age of 93 years this was just a part of the history so that uh, it becomes interesting now what does laser mean it stands the acronym stands for light a for amplification stimulated e for emission and r for radiation so it's basically light amplification through stimulated emission of radiation that means got four properties number one it spontaneously absorbs energy then the population inversion occurs in the medium then spontaneous emission of energy occurs from the medium and then stimulated emission that further stimulates the emission from the same medium so it's got these four important characteristics whenever we talk about a laser medium now let's to understand this uh, a bit better let's go a bit further so this is a resting state 
of a particular substance or medium where most of the atoms are in the resting state a few of them in our in our higher energy states or very higher energy states e1 to en right uh, at a higher energy state very few atoms are there you apply as energy to this particular medium energy from any kind of source whether it's a light energy it's electrical energy whatever energy. so once energy is given to this source uh, to this uh, medium what have from a particular source what happens the the atoms they are inverted in the sense that less of them would be found in the resting state and more of them would be found in higher energy states. So you see that they initially at the e to the power n you had very few atoms, now there are a lot of atoms there. So this energy has led to a population inversion or unstable state in that particular medium leading to what? To atoms getting into higher energy state. But is it a sustainable uh, scenario? No. Once you stop the energy, once you stop the energy supply to that medium, the atoms have to return back to their original state. But when they return back to their original state or the resting state, they would be emitting energy. Now, this emission of energy is a spontaneous emission because the energy uh, delivery has stopped. So the higher energy state, the atoms in higher energy state, they would now release their energy to return back to their original state. So that is a spontaneous. Now, in doing so, they would also stimulate other atoms to do so. That means it is stimulating emission of photons or energy packets of electromagnetic waves. So that is what a spontaneous and stimulated emission of photons basically means. <clears throat> so the properties of lasers are pretty clear. Number one, from visible from visible light, how is it different? Number one, it is a monochromatic, that is a single color light, while a natural light is not a single color, it's got the whole spectrum of the rainbow. So you have a single very narrow or well-defined wavelength light, monochromatic. It is coherent. Coherent basically means light is perfectly in phase. That means each peak and trough uh, will match with each other in, in, uh, with respect to time and space. So it's a coherent light. Laser beam is non-divergent. It's a very, very collimated. That means a very sharp beam. And there's only one degree of divergence over every meter travel. So that's a very, very narrow beam. A light, uh, a natural light or visible light is a divergent. It will spread everywhere. You light a bulb in one end of the room and you'll have light everywhere. Not so with laser. You uh, put the laser on, it will focus beam to a particular very, very small area. So it is monochromatic, it is coherent, and it is non-divergent. The fluence of a laser beam is basically the measure of the energy delivered by that laser over a particular area. So it is measured in watts, that is the power, or joules over centimeter square. And larger the area at delivery, that means the, the larger the area where the energy is being delivered, the less would be the concentration and wider would be the effect. But remember one thing, and that is most of these properties are altered when the laser is made to pass through a fiber. Now this is how a laser unit looks like. So you got a lasing medium out here that we're talking about to which energy is now being supplied. So in this lasing medium, when the energy is supplied, the atoms go into higher energy states and they start vibrating. So they get reflected from these two mirrors from, uh, from uh, to and fro. They get uh, knocked out from one mirror to the other mirror. And here you find that there is a small aperture in this mirror. So this random knocking can be, once you open this opening in this mirror, and that is what is done when you press the pedal of the laser beam, a very sharp beam, so the atom escape from here, from the outer sheet, and the beam travels from that particular area, <coughs> from the source to the uh, part from where the laser beam is applied. So the whole thing is nothing but a chamber in which you have uh, reflecting atoms from one mirror to the other mirror. Why are they reflecting? Because they have been pushed into high energy state. Why? Because the energy source is applied. And once we stop the energy source, they would release the energy and that energy can be channeled through a very small aperture which can be opened for a very period of time and that photon or, or the packet of energy gets released from this very small aperture for a very little period of time onto the site where it is being applied. So you got a hollow tube with opposing mirrors which are totally reflecting, partially reflecting, you are the lasing medium, you are the energy source. And remember one thing, because of very high uh, temperature being generated, so there's an outer sheet through which you pass a coolant and that keeps the inner tube cool. Now, the release of the laser beam, we said about the release of the laser beam, 
so that aperture that we are talking about, so that release can occur as a continuous way that we keep the pressure on and the aperture is open and until you press it, the pressure on the pedal is on, it is open until you want it. But there is a second mode and that is pulse, that even despite pushing the pedal on, this aperture will open for a very small fraction of time. And Q switched is for an even less fraction of time. Here we are talking about nanoseconds. Here we talk about nanoseconds. Here we talk about seconds. So that is how the, the laser beam comes out from the source and is directed onto the, onto the site. So either as a continuous wave, the laser can focus as a continuous wave or it can come as a pulsed wave. It switches on, switches off, switches on, switches off. And Q switch mode basically is a very, very fraction of a second, that means nanosecond, and then off. So here, see, the energy is only 100 watts, but in a fraction of a second, you're reaching a very high energy level of almost one megawatt. So that is the method of release. So uh, you have a number of lasers in the market, and you come across terms like a carbon dioxide laser or neodymium YAG laser. So what are the lasers all about? So there's a need to classify the laser and understand their classification. So one is based on the delivery method. We have an optical fiber laser or laser which are being delivered through an optical arm. So that is the delivery method classification. The second is the lasing medium classification. That is the medium which generates the laser beam for you. So you have solid state laser where you use a crystal. This could be most commonly a ruby or a neodymium yttrium aluminum garnet dot with neodymium. Or you can have a liquid laser. These are mostly dyes commonly used uh, for delivering or uh, for generating the laser beam. Or you can have the very commonly used gas laser, the most common being the carbon dioxide laser. You also have a xenon fluoride laser or the argon laser. A term excimer laser uh, needs to be understood. There's nothing but a modification of the gas laser. Here, there's a high pressure pulsed gas laser. Uh, the name derives from two words, excited and dimer. So this is using reactive gases like chlorine or fluorine. They're mixed with inert gases such as argon, krypton or xenon. And what happens is when there's a mixing, there's excitation and generation of a pseudo molecule or a dimer is produced. So with excitation, a dimer is produced. That's why the name excimer. And it emits in the ultraviolet range. And then of course, one now, now the a uh, very commonly used laser that is a diode or a semiconductor laser. These are very small, very low power and very, very commonly used in a wide range of medical application and also in industry like for example in printer, laser printers and in CD players. Then comes the classification based on the wavelength and you have the visible light, the infrared and the near infrared. So these are the three ranges of the electromagnetic uh, spectrum in which the laser light is emitted. So either as a visible light or as an infrared or near infrared. So visible light lasers are those which have got optical wavelengths roughly between 400 to uh, 700 nanometer which is similar to what you have in a visible light. That's why they are not visible light lasers. The energy is strongly absorbed by pigments and it can easily be transmitted through water. The argon was the first visible light laser to be used laparoscopically. A relatively low power argon laser was used to treat endometriosis or in cholecystectomy. Then you got the KTP or the potassium titanyl uh, phosphate, which is a frequency double neodymium YAG laser. It's just a modification of neodymium YAG laser where the frequency has been doubled. And they're very commonly used in gynecological and surgical applications. Then the second group are those which are emitted in the infrared range and these are known as infrared lasers, strongly absorbed by water. The first one, remember, was absorbed by pigments and was being transmitted through uh, water. Here it is strongly absorbed by water and because it is in the infrared range, so it requires visible light for its transmission. So if you want to aim a laser beam, it has to pass through, uh, you have to combine a visible light with that beam so that you know where the laser beam is going. And the most common example is the carbon dioxide, which can never be delivered through a fiber or the holmium uh, YAG laser, which can be delivered through a fiber. Then you've got the near infrared lasers. These are neither absorbed by pigments nor by water. So the first one was by pigment. The second one was being absorbed by water. That is visible light by pigments, infrared lasers by water, and near infrared neither by water nor by pigment. 
and they require again superimposed visible light laser for aiming similar to the infrared laser why because these are also invisible and the most common example is the new beam yag laser which got a long excision length and significant scatter now because it's not absorbed it scatters when you aim it it scatters and because of the scatter it combines to make the laser behave like a volume heater of tissue and is a good coagulator but it is not a good cutter so the new beam yag laser because not being absorbed either by water or by pigment it scatters and becomes a volume coagulator not a very good cutter now delivery as we said earlier the laser can either be delivered through a, a beam or it can be delivered through a fiber you know through a beam is through an optical arm and optical fiber delivers it directly at the site where it has to be delivered now this optical fiber has got two parts the central part is the core which transmits the beam and outside you got the protective sheath now this optical fiber the advantage is it can be flexible or rigid and it represents a very ideal way of transmission why and a very good efficiency why because the whole of the laser beam is, is being delivered at the point where the the fiber is making contact with the tissue right so the total amount of laser is being converted into energy and it can easily be used for endoscopic purposes but there can be two limitations one it can only transmit light with a wavelength close to the ultraviolet or infrared spectrum number two they modify the geometry of the laser beam when leaving the fiber the beam is no longer parallel or collimated but it becomes divergent remember we said the three important advantages of a laser beam and we said that these properties change if it is being transmitted to the fiber so the collimated property that means non divergent property of the laser beam that changes and it becomes divergent when it is transmitted through a fiber the optical arm which gives rise to the laser beam is caused by laser emitted in the ultraviolet or infrared spectrum and the most common example is the carbon dioxide uh, laser and the optical arm that we talk about is got multi mirror system and it emits the beam which is then directed onto the site where it is being applied some of the common laser which can be transmitted through fibers which are in common usage we have just tried to list them and the yttrium aluminum garnet lasers the new dbm and the holmium number 2 you can also have a alternate holmium that is the yttrium scandium gallium garnet then you got the ktp i said that it is nothing but the uh, doubling doubling the frequency and halving the wavelength of a uh, new dbm yag laser you have the very commonly used diode the thulium lasers and the new entrant that is the erbium yttrium aluminum garnet now lasers these fiber lasers can be used very commonly for lithotripsy of gall bladder the kidney or bladder stones it can also be used for dissection uh, while doing a cholecystectomy or dissection for any other organ um, surgery inside the abdomen for venous diseases arterial blockage can be removed with them you can have a large prostate disease which is a very very common and very early use for laser uh, surgery you can have endodontics that means oro maxillofacial dental application and of course it can be used through all kinds of endoscopy the commonly used lasers in medicine with the important properties among them i have just highlighted the ones that are very commonly used in red the diode the new dbm yag laser and the carbon dioxide and you have the wavelength the absorption chromophore and the application now what is the chromophore i just come to that in a short while so these are basically the chromophore that absorb them and then you got the application now when you talk about the laser physics you have the carbon dioxide laser uh, the important lasers so one is in the lasing medium is carbon dioxide very commonly used energy in the range of invisible infrared wave band requires an aiming beam we already said that it's an invisible laser so it requires a beam and that beam is supplied by either red helium or neon beam its chromophore is water which exists everywhere chromophore basically we will talk about it later on but chromophore is basically a, a pigment or a part of the cell or part of the tissue which absorbs the laser beam that is known as a chromophore it can be endogenous it can be exogenous so these chromophores are basically what absorb and then give the uh, required effect to that particular tissue so until it is absorbed the laser beam cannot give rise to any effect so in context to carbon dioxide the chromophore is water exists everywhere so cannot be used for selective photothermolysis now what is selective photothermolysis this again we will talk about now when the laser beam aims on the tissue 
it leads to ablation of the tissue or a number of other effects on the tissue. Now, if the pigment is say localized in a particular A point A and your beam is such that it will be absorbed by that particular point A, so that surrounding point B which does not have the pigment A will not be affected by the laser. So what are you doing? With that laser beam, you are selectively causing whatever effect is available at point number A. So that is selective laser effect. Now, when you are causing a thermolysis because of the laser beam, it will be known as selective photothermolysis. So, it is largely dependent upon two things, the wavelength of a laser beam and of course, the tissue characteristics, especially the chromophore which is present in the tissue. There is minimal scattering with the carbon dioxide, so total energy is absorbed in the tissue water. Tissue penetration is superficial, so prevents deeper tissue damage and the tissue effect could be two. One, it can lead to precise blood rate incision. If you have a focus beam, if you have a broad unfocused beam, then it can act as a coagulator, ablator, or a bulk vaporizer. The second one is the neodymium YAG laser, the single YAG crystal, and that is covered with neodymium ions. Wavelength you already talked about in that chart. Again, it is an invisible laser, so requires a visible guiding beam. Again, red helium, neon beam, or others. Can also be transmitted through fibers. Remember. The carbon dioxide was not transmissible through fiber. This can be transmitted through fiber. The penetration is about 3 to 5 millimeters, which is not more than the carbon dioxide laser. And because there is no key tissue chromophore which can absorb the this wavelength of neodymium YAG, that's why remember we said that the scattering effect of the neodymium YAG laser is quite high, minimal penetration, and lower temperature generation. That's why. It is ideal for hemostasis and destruction of large volume tumors and application through endoscopic procedure. And that is a singular advantage, or rather these are the advantages of the uh, new DMM YAG laser that can be used through endoscope and it can all act as a volume coagulator. It can also uh, act like a large volume ablator of tumors. Now coming to the third, there's an ion laser. These are nothing but gas lasers. Again, in the visible light, so this is different. The carbon dioxide and the new DMM were invisible lasers. This is a visible laser using argon or krypton. The wavelength is between 250 to 530 nanometers and the dominant is the blue laser in this uh, 488 nanometer and the green in 514 nanometer. Now they operate similar to the gas laser, like for example the, the carbon dioxide laser, but, but these lasers, they ionize the active medium and they excite ions instead of atoms. So here it is basically ionic effect, that's why they are known as ion lasers. Not the atomic effect, this is the ion laser. Absorbed by red pigment chromophores like hemoglobin and melanin, use a large power supply, Limited penetration, so ideal for skin and eye disorders. They can operate at both pulsed and C uh, or intermittent mode. So remember, I told you that either it could be a continuous wave, that means the aperture is open throughout until the laser beam is on, or it could be pulsed, that means the aperture keeps shutting off and on. And it can also be used for a photodynamic therapy. And then coming to the most common uh, right now, one of the very, very common uses of lasers that is the diode laser. These are very, very compact and portable solid state units. They are flexible fibers, that means it can be transmitted through fibers. The, the laser that we now commonly use for proctology, use in DPH surgery or other surgical applications, like for example endovascular application in the varicose way, they are all diode lasers. So they are excellent for internal minimally invasive surgery through an endoscope. The flexible fibers gives an added advantage and they can be placed in a handpiece for direct surgery. Excellent for cutting. Coagulation used strictly for soft tissue procedures and they penetrate 2 to 3 millimeters or more into the soft tissue, depending upon, again, I told you the wavelength and the tissue characteristics. Right? Wavelength most commonly used for by the diode lasers are in the range of 810 to 106 for nanometer. For proctology, for bilateral sinuses, we usually work in 810 to 940 nanometer. Oro and maxillofacial surgery are one of the very important application diode lasers in proctology, paranoidal surgery, endovascular. These are all the wavelengths which are used by these diode lasers. So see the whole range of medical application of diode lasers. Starting with the photodynamic therapy on the lower wavelength, right to the higher wavelengths, you have a, a endovascular laser treatment, liposuction, then you got general surgery application, prostate, varicose vein, and so on and so forth. So this gives the wavelength and this gives the medical application. We can go through this. Uh, chart, I would not like to repeat what is written in the chart. 
Right. Now coming to the BPS treatment because it's one of the most commonly um, carried out treatment by laser and the most common is the neodymium YAG laser, penetrability 3 to 5 millimeter, holmium YAG laser, the KTP or the double frequency neodymium YAG laser, the diode lasers now and then of course now the latest entry to the YAG laser group and you have the penetrability of 3 to 6 millimeters. So that is an advantage that means when you're cutting the prostate is not going to damage the bladder wall. So these are the commonly used lasers for the treatment. Now coming to the most important thing, how does the laser work? We have been talked about what the lasers are and what they are doing. How do they work? Now for laser tissue interaction, whenever the laser touches the tissue, the laser energy has to be absorbed by a chromophore. If it is not absorbed by a chromophore, then there will be no effect. Non-absorption, just passing through, there will be no effect. Now that chromophore at the target site, the short wavelengths of lasers are always absorbed better than the long wavelength. So that's why I said that when you go to the larger wavelength or the longer wavelength of neodymium yang laser, the absorption is less. But with, when you have a carbon dioxide, say a carbon dioxide absorbed by water, which is omnipresent throughout the body, then the effect would be uh, the, the short wavelength and the effect would be uh, a generalized effect or a widespread effect. Now, what are these chromophores? So it's a material present either endogenously, that means inherently present in your tissue, or it can be introduced in your tissue exogenously and which absorbs the particular wavelength. So if you have a chromophore, it's not going to absorb all wavelengths of laser wave. A particular tissue or a particular pigment is going to absorb, a particular chromophore is going to absorb only one particular wavelength of a laser. That means all lasers will not work on a particular tissue. That's what it try, is trying to tell you. So a particular pigment absorbs a particular uh, wavelength laser, right? There could be one or more of those wavelengths, right? Now, skin has an abundance of these chromophores. Now, what are these endogenous chromophores we are talking about? What are these chromophores present in your body as a natural result? The most common are the water. We said the water. Number two, hemoglobin and light pigment. That means melanin. So, you have the oxyhemoglobin, the deoxyhemoglobin, the melanin. And then the proteins, the peptide bonds, the aromatic amino acids, nucleic acid, the flavins in your tissue, and the cytochrome oxidase and bilirubin are all those pigments which can easily absorb a particular wavelength of a laser beam. Skin has an abundance of these chromophores. Now for visible light and near infrared light lasers, the main target chromophore are the hemoglobin and melanin, the pigment. While carbon dioxide laser we said stressed earlier is the only chromophore for water. Right? So the water is the only chromophore I would say for carbon dioxide lasers. Exogenous chromophores can be introduced from the outside. Now the third thing which makes a difference to the laser tissue interaction is the target side effect would depend upon what? Number one, the tissue properties, we already said that, the chromophore which is present there. And because the chromophore, like for example, say uh, we have got a particular chromophore, for, as I said even earlier, at point A, it is not there at point B. So only point A would have the laser tissue effect, it would not be at point B. Although they are both adjacent to each other. So this is a selective action of the laser depending upon the chromophore at the target site or the tissue properties at the target site. And because the surrounding tissue will not be having a chromophore or that particular tissue property, the effect of laser will not be there. Then it will also depend upon the laser characteristics. What laser characteristics are we talking about? We talk about the wavelength of the laser. We talk about the fluence, which we said was the density or the watts per centimeter square or joules per centimeter square. That means the intensity of the uh, energy focus at that particular point. And then of course the pulse duration. Suppose the laser beam is on, you depress the pedal, continuous wave, CW or the continuous wave. Or you can have a pulse, that means on and off, on and off. Or you can have an even shorter on, which is a Q switch mode or the Q pulse mode where it is on only for a nanosecond. So it depends upon up to what time is the laser energy being beamed onto that particular point. If it is a continuous beam, obvious, very obvious, the effect would be much more. Then it will also depend upon the depth of penetration of laser light. And the depth depends upon what? Whether the light after focusing itself is being absorbed totally or it is being reflected or it is being refracted through the fiber or it is scattered at the site. If it is not collimated, it's a divergent getting scattered. And then of course the time of exposure, we already talked about that, the pulse duration. So if you have a shortest time exposure, the effect which you perceive is a photoablative effect. 
If you have a longer time, that means the laser beam is on for a longer period of time, then it will also heat the tissue. So you have the photothermal effect, right? Now, the final tissue effect can be divided for sake of understanding into those which are wavelength dependent mechanism. That means it depends on the wavelength of the laser beam and wavelength independent mechanism if you want to group the laser tissue interaction. So if you have the wavelength dependent mechanism, you have four types of tissue effects. Number one, it could be photothermal. That means the tissue is heated after the application of laser beam. And that is the most common effect by most surgically used lasers. Number two could be a photoablative. That means the laser beam ablates. That means remove the tissue without heating it. That's very important. Then your photobiological effect, your photochemical effect, also known as the photodynamic effect. And those that are wavelength independent, that is the photomechanical effect. Now, the temperature ultimately produced at the site is relatively low when you compare it with the electrosurgical unit. Electrosurgical unit works almost if you keep it on, it can reach a peak of 300 to 400 degrees centigrade. Here, the peak is much lower at around 200 degrees centigrade. Now, first let's talk about the most common effect, that is the photothermal effect. And this is the most important application of surgical lasers manifested as what? When you apply a laser beam and look at a photothermal effect, you're looking either as a pure heating leading to vaporization of tissue or you can look, you're looking at cutting where the carbon dioxide laser cuts for you and a coagulation, the neodymium YAG laser or the argon laser. Now for minimizing the side effects, the laser on the tissue, the pulse time should not exceed the cooling time. That means when you push the laser beam onto a particular tissue, it heats the tissue. That's the photothermal effect. But then you can't keep heating it. Otherwise, what's going to happen? The heat is going to spread throughout the body. Or rather, I wouldn't say throughout the body, it's going to spread throughout that particular tissue. That's going to have harmful effect. So the laser beam has to be interrupted point. So whenever you're pushing the laser in, even if it's a continuous uh, wave mode, you have to have intervening periods allowing the tissue to cool down. So if the pulse on time is more than the cooling time, then the harmful effects are much more. And that's why it says that the pulse on time should not exceed the cooling time or the thermal relaxation time in between pulse. Number three is the laser induced interstitial thermotherapy. So here what you're looking at is you for, the, for acting on a tumor, you're not beaming your laser beam out of the tumor. You're beaming it at the interstitial tissue. Doing what? You're cutting the blood supply to the interstitial tissue. And from the interstitial tissue, the, the heat effect, because this is a photothermal effect, the heat permeates to the center of the tumor and leads to ablation of the tumor. So this would work both ways. It would ablate the tumor directly also. And number two, by cutting down on the blood supply through the interstitial tissue, that is laser induced interstitial thermotherapy. Now, photoablative effect, I told you what is most important. Again, it is ablation of a particular uh, tumor, but here without the thermal effect. So, ablative photo decomposition, the laser beam destroys without raising the temperature, like in scalpel cutting. So, remember, we said the time period. If it is on for a long time, it will be photothermal effect, a very short burst, less than nanosecond, it will cut without increasing the temperature, so it acts like a scalpel. So this photoablative effect is more like a scalpel effect without raising the temperature. How does it occur? Molecular bonds are broken and tissue vaporizes without any generation of thermal energy. Where can it be used? Mainly in tissues which do not bleed. Why? Because remember with the scalpel, as soon as you cut a tissue, what happens? Bleeding starts. Similarly, if the laser is being used in the cutting mode, the bleeding will occur. So it's no different than a scalpel. So obviously, if you're using the laser for a cutting, then it has to be used in those tissues where the blood supply is minimal. It cannot be used in normal vascularized tissue. Otherwise, you will end up with bleeding. And that is why it is mainly used in tissues where there is minimal amount of vascularity. Orthopedic uses, ophthalmics, like for example, LASIK surgery, when you're doing a band keratoplasty, that means you are acting on the cornea. And arterectomy of peripheral blood vessels are typical uses where photoablative effect of the laser beam is being utilized. Then you have the photodynamic or the photochemical effect, and this uses a photosynthesizer. Now, photosensitizer, which is absorbed by the disease cell, 
if you push in a photosensitizer or the photosensitizer is there inherently and you pass a beam of a particular wavelength which is being absorbed by that photosensitizer right sensitizer so that beam visible laser is absorbed by the photosensitizer and then what happens it releases active reactive oxygen species which then damage the cell dna and other vital molecules in the cell now this photosensitizer can also be activated after absorbing light from other sources so remember the photodynamic therapy is not specific only for laser any kind of light can be a particular photosensitizer can absorb let's say visible light that is the photodynamic effect but here we are talking about the laser photodynamic effect okay so make this uh, in proper perspective make this very clear that photodynamic is not synonymous with laser effect laser can give rise to photodynamic effect other energy sources can also give rise to photodynamic effect like example invisible light commonly used photosensitizers which are uh, used in the photodynamic effect for by lasers is derived from porphyrins chlorophylls and dyes cell death issues because that uh, that photosensitizer absorb the laser beam so that cell dies there is limited penetration of visible laser light so that's why it forms a very very good uh, use in superficial skin conditions like basal cell carcinoma squamous cell carcinoma and psoriasis so that is the the photodynamic effect of a laser beam coming to photobiological effect now these are very very low power lasers known as low laser level therapy or low intensity low power therapy uses a monochromatic beam as i said earlier near infrared light spectrum again a near infrared light spectrum so it's invisible what do they use use for soft tissue stimulation for wound healing treating inflammation nerve regeneration hair removal and cosmetic surgery fat dissolution bone tissue pain relief so these are basically the photobiological that is a stimulatory effect so this is less than the normal energy being supplied to stimulate the tissues to do more depending upon what tissue you are aiming at so you may be propagating wound healing you may be treating the inflammation you may be helping in nerve regeneration and so on and so forth so that the photobiological effect and then coming to the photomechanical effect which we said it does not depend upon the wavelengths is wavelength independent so here what is happening is the laser beam is ionizes and creates a controlled plasma field and how does it do so you are using femtosecond pulses or pico or pico second pulses so it's not even nano it is now gone beyond pico 10 to the power minus 12 fem to 10 to the power minus 15 so that is the amount uh, the time uh, 10 to the minus 15 uh, second that is the time for the for which the laser beam is on you can't even imagine that is not even one second 10 to the power minus 15 of a second that is a fem to second so these are the pulses very high pressure gradient shock wave setup that shock wave will disrupt the tissue mechanically causing cavitation inside soft tissue clean and precise surgery without thermomechanical damage right and the neodymium yag laser prime example giving rise to photomechanical effects helpful in superficial like lesions like you just and you was endoscopy lithotripsy where they doing a cbd lithotripsy you are helping in a in a urs uh, they you want to shatter the the stone inside the ureter so neodymium yag laser has all these apart there also other lasers also this is just one example even the holium laser helps right so if you look broadly at the use of laser one they can be used for diagnostic purposes we use a laser capture micro dissection technique which is probably better than a pcr or a laser scanning cytometry and of course therapeutics used for its ablative and hemostatic effect two broad effects the complications depend upon what the surgeon's expertise and prior experience of laser is one of the more important determinants so your expertise of course the laser uh, the characteristics of laser beam but your expertise and your prior and the prior experience of using laser it also would depend upon the radiation scatter the depth of penetration the hot electrodes it relates to abdominal compartment syndrome and abdomen complications like for example when you using it for extensive injury in the region of callus triangle using it for laparoscopic cholecystectomy you cause extensive injury that's why laser is hardly ever used now for carrying out cholecystectomies diaphragmatic injury can easily occur at sinus injury and vascular injuries are all possible with intra abdominal use of lasers the scatter divergence is one of the prime reasons why you can have the 
the damage because you're aiming it at one particular point, but if the beam scatters or diverges from the point A to let's say a surrounding point B or C or D, then that will lead to problem. And 15-20% scatter in all direction can lead to sub-boiling tissue. So at the point A where it is beamed, it is giving rise to a temperature of let's say about 100 degrees centigrade. But surrounding let's say about 15 degrees uh, apart, away from it, it is giving rise to about 70 degrees. But even 70 degrees temperature is higher for your tissue. So it gives rise to sub-boiling tissue. Deeper damage can also occur because unlike completely burned a shard which stops the beam, a sub-boiling tissue will never stop the beam of laser and will allow the beam to pass. So further damage by deeper penetration. Also energy transmitted through tissues because of deeper penetration of laser becomes divergent. Because at point A it is not divergent. But when it is penetrating deeper and it is encountering tissue which are partially burned, it gets scattered inside. So it becomes more and more divergent inside and injurious. So that's why the quantifying that injury in the deeper tissues become much more difficult. Then you can have laser fiber related complications where the fiber which has got a sapphire tip which is delivering the energy to that particular area gets broken. If it gets broken, if it completely breaks then you lose the tip that is a problem. But if it gets cracked, that crack will allow laser beam to escape sideways also. So it, if you have a sapphire tip which is there to prevent scatter and use as a cautery probe and cut the tissue, but if the probe tip is hot, it can cause perforation and repeated heating and cooling of the fiber cause formation of cracks. I just not told you. Now through that crack, you can have a laser beam escaping. So cause the divergence of beam indicated as a bright flare and can get detached as a foreign body and then you go on searching for the sapphire tip inside that particular area where it has got lost. So always keep the beam of the laser, the tip, always in your field of vision. So which is better, laser or e-surgery, which is better? Advantage probably is laser because totally predictable tissue effects, including depth and laser effect is always in the surgeon's field. So probably if you have to choose between the two, probably a laser would be a better choice. So I just try to give you the physical principles for the use of laser. I'm not going into the great details of the medical uh, application because that would come with each organ and which laser you're trying to use. This was just a, a broad outline as to how the laser works and how the ultrasonic beam works. Now just a few terminologies which are commonly used when you talk about energy sources. One of them is diathermy. Now, now uh, you can hear uh, a, re a refrain in the OT that bring on the diathermy which is supposed to mean electrosurgical unit, but that's wrong. It's, so what is really is diathermy? Diathermy is not an electrosurgical unit. Electrosurgery is electrosurgery. It is not electrocautery. It is not diathermy. Remember that. But then what is diathermy? Now, a diathermy has been defined by the Food and Drug Association of USA as it is a device which produces heat between 40 degrees centigrade to 45 degrees centigrade at a depth of 2 inches below the skin in not more than 20 minutes. So within 20 minutes should raise the temperature of only 40 to 45 degrees centigrade. Compare this to electrosurgical unit. What temperature are we talking about when we talk about electrosurgical unit? Right up to 400 degrees centigrade. Benefit of a diathermy increases blood flow and speeds of metabolism and rate of ion diffusion across cell membrane. So this is basically something which is stimulatory to healing process or stimulatory to the body tissue. Electrosurgical unit is not stimulatory. So we're basically talking about a diathermy used for physiotherapy. But diathermy can also have a surgical user. But that is different from a electrosurgical unit. Here it is used to destroy superficial neoplasm, warts, infected tissues. It can cauterize superficial blood vessels and it can particularly be available in neurosurgery and surgery of the eye. But it's different from electrosurgery, right? The mainly for physiotherapy in the form of fibrous tissues and tendons, joint capsules, it, it acts on the fibrous tissues doing what? If they, uh, once you apply the diathermy, then these tissues relax and can be more easily stretched and this result, it results in relief of stiffness of joints. Similarly, it promotes relaxation of muscles and relief of spasm. So that is the prime use of a diathermy. And that brings us to a very important uh, point that is diathermy is not only electric. It is can be delivered by ultrasound. You have ultrasound diathermy, you can have a laser diathermy, you can have electrical diathermy. Electrical diathermy is one which is being confused with electrocautery and with uh, electrosurgery. Right? Now, electrical diathermy, which we are just now talking about, is by high frequency electromagnetic waves and it can be a short wave, 
it could be a microwave, it could be electrical diathermy. So three types. Now this electrical diathermy versus electrocautery, which we're talking about, the diathermy is dielectric heating. So here what we're looking at in diathermy is that the current is never passing through your body. You have got two poles attached to the body, either forms of uh, two electrodes on your body at opposing points of, let's say, for the limb, and in the in the other you can have, let's say, a circular uh, cushion-like thing surrounding your body, which can uh, deliver the diathermy to your body. So basically, here there's a high frequency alternating field between these two. The effect is produced as in a microwave oven, and this produces dielectric heating by rotation of the molecular dipole. So the current is never entering your body. Similarly, electrocautery, again, the, uh, the current is not entering your body. But here, in electrocautery, remember we said that we're heating a metal object and that metal object then being applied to your body. So here, the direct current in electrocautery is used to heat the cautery probe. And here, it is the dielectric heating produced by rotating ions uh, between the two poles. Now, what is a microwave? When we talk about the microwave, we are talking about a high induced current in this range. So, we, we are talking about the radio wave, electrosurgical unit, then we talk about the infrared and ultraviolet. This was the visible light, L is the visible light. So, here we talk about microwave somewhere in between the infrared and radio wave. So, as you go up the scale, you can see that the frequency keeps on increasing and here you are basically talking about the wavelengths which goes on. So, microwave electromagnetic radiation with wavelengths ranging from as long as 1 meter to as short as 1 millimeter operates at ultra high speed, very high frequency, right? Higher than the electrosurgical unit. Low energy temperatures achieved only 40 to 45 for extended periods of time. This is just like a microwave oven. You have an oven in your kitchen and you put something in, put it on and it heats. Does it burn it? Normally not because you set the temperature. So it is given temperature only 43 to 45 degrees and for a microwave oven or microwave food. Here also, like in a microwave, when you use for surgical application or for medicinal application, you're basically using it for heating the tissues in the range of 40 to 45 degrees. And how does it do that? The energy is primarily transferred to the tissue by capacitive coupling, field heating, that's not field heating, causes vibration of particles in the tissue, resulting in tissue heating. So again, here's vibration of particles we're talking about. It can also result in coagulated necrosis and cell death. Now, heating pattern is more spread out because in, in, uh, uh, in a microwave delivery of energy, uh, in the microwave range, it is a widespread delivery injury. So, you have got a more spread out or larger ablation zones and tends to deliver lesser heating than at lower frequencies as in radio frequency ablation. Now, <clears throat> the microwave ablation is the most important use of microwave medicinal purposes and the main advantage is when compared to the radio frequency ablation, this microwave ablation will give rise to higher intratumoral temperatures, larger tumor ablation volumes, faster time, and improved convection profile. So microwave ablation has promising potential in the treatment of primary and secondary liver disease, primary and secondary lung malignancies, renal adrenal tumors, and bone metastasis are some of the applications where microwave ablation has been tried. Now compare this with the radio frequency ablation and you read of the radio frequency ablation for liver tumors, for kidney tumors. So here we are talking about a frequency of 460 to 550 kilohertz as in e-surgery. Results in vibration atoms in the cells friction causing heat generation of up to 100 degrees cell death. There it was 45 to 47 degrees but radio frequency ablation devices use a continuous sinusoidal waveform while electrosurgical unit use a variable form and time. Remember, we said that for coagulation, you have only 6% on, 94% off. For cutting, you had 100% on. So that was the variable form and time. So here, it uses a continuous sinusoidal form. It is not on and off for less than 6% or 94%. It is a continuous. And that's why there's a higher core temperature is achieved by the radio frequency ablation device as compared to ESU because here it is a constant delivery of that particular uh, radio frequency ablative energy, energy to that particular tube. So it's related to the duration of current because in here the duration of current is constant and so that's why the temperature achieved is a constant not fluctuating. In e-surgery the temperature rises for a second and then comes down but radio frequency ablation the higher temperature is there for 10 to 15 minutes.
best for deep seated localized malignant growth delivered through ct guided prongs so the prongs have to be put in they have been pushed they have to be pushed into the tumor and then through that you apply the radio frequency ablation high fractal is a high frequency eradication eradicator now there's nothing the machine of uh, high fractal was basically nothing but an electrosurgical unit uh, named by a particular company it is sometimes used to refer to any dedicated non ground return ngr non ground return machine like the esu any of these right so you have non ground return low power high frequency high voltage alternating current like an electrosurgical ablator the different from esu is that it is lower powered not intended for cutting and also for use in conscious patient on an insulated table while the electrosurgical unit usually cannot be used on a conscious patient that means anesthetized patient on a insulated table electrode is either bipolar output or monopolar just like a electrosurgical unit high fractals are used in two principal modes desiccation fulgurition i just not told you you cannot have cutting mode with a high fractal or high frequency radiation clinical use where is it used chirurgy dentistry ophthalmic use gynecological plastic surgery tattooing so mostly superficial uses wards penile papules desiccation just like what we use for a diathermy machine for superficial we use a surgical use of a diathermy machine only for surgical for superficial uh, growths or uh, electrocautery of bleeding Appellation, destruction of small cosmetically unwanted superficial veins and basal carcinoma plantar wart. So the whole usage of these high frequency radicators is a superficial use in in uh, such application. Then you come to hydro dissection, which is a high velocity, high pressure water. It cuts cleanly. Now we talk about very high velocity to cut the tissue. Problem is the hail storm effect is always there because once you push water at a very high speed onto a particular tissue, it is going to come back to you. So that is a hail storm effect with misting of telescope, non-hemostatic. It will not stop the bleeding. Difficult depth assessment. You cannot uh, assess up to what depth it's going. Spraying of tissue fragment. So oncologically unsound. The users can be used for lymphadenectomy, dissection of solid organs, and to rect me. And then coming to the last point, there is a cryotherapy. Where is it used? In cryotherapy, the agents which are used are liquid nitrogen, carbon dioxide, snow, argon, and dimethyl propane. And the forms of cryotherapy: one is cryosurgery, that means cryoablation. You remove a tissue with the help of cryo. A hyalotherapy, ice pack therapy, and cryogenic chamber therapy are the four forms of cryotherapy that are in common use. Now, the pathophysiology: there is formation of ice crystal within the cells. disrupts the membrane and interrupts the cellular metabolism it coagulates the blood coagulation of blood thereby interrupting blood flow tissue lead to ischemia cell death and induction of apoptosis or programmed cell death cascade so these are the three methods by which you have the effect of cryosurgery and cryoablation now uses to ablate solid tumors found in lung liver breast kidney prostate most commonly in prostate and renal cryoablation application sites it can either be surface or it can be percutaneously so you can have on the surface of the kidney or percutaneously if you want to use it through the skin or to a particular different site like for example in breast application methods laparoscopic or by open surgical process the third form is hyalotherapy or second form hyalotherapy uh, of form cryotherapy is hyalotherapy is a controlled time and controlled temperature between 10 to 20 degrees centigrade you are not going below that Instead of the normal 37 degrees, you have brought it down to 10 to 20 degrees. Results in immediate vasoconstriction with reflex vasodilatation, decreased local metabolism, enzymatic activity, and decreased oxygen demand. It improves the tissue recovery in orthopedic surgery, plastic surgery, and oral and maxillofacial surgery. Then cryotherapy, which can be delivered with an ice pack, or it can be delivered by a cryogenic chamber therapy. Here, the temperatures are much, much, much less. Up to minus 120 degrees centigrade to minus 140 degrees centigrade. That's why the word cryogenic chamber therapy for three minutes. Skin cooling to up to five minutes. It triggers the release of endorphins for prolonged periods with clinical relief by analgesia of up to weeks. So, if you want to give analgesia, cryogenic chambers are one of the good methods 
of giving lasting pain relief or lasting analgesia. Useful in conditions such as psychological stress, insomnia, rheumatism, muscle and joint pain. So thank you for your time. I've tried to, in these three, the, the group of three lectures, I've tried to uh, give a bird's eye view of energy sources to a general surgeon, what he should know, uh, what he's dealing with, how do they work, and what could be the side effects and what could be the harmful effects. I've tried to cover, uh, I, have not, I may not have covered the entire gamut of requirements, but I've tried to push across the important points as far as the energy sources, uh, energy sources are concerned. So I think you can um, go back to these lectures. If you want to revisit these lectures, you can go back to the uh, channel uh, on YouTube. And please do not forget to subscribe to this channel if you uh, happen to be looking at it for the first time. So thank you for your time. And until next time with a different lecture. Thank you.